Guru Nation, welcome back to another episode of Random Musings from the Clinical Trials Guru. Listen, we're preparing for, we're preparing slash promoting SOS Conference, February 2nd, 2024. So if you're watching this in the future, just think of the next conference, whatever year it is, the next one, there's always going to be a SOS Conference, God willing. Uh, we have one of my panelists, so I'm on two, I'm on, I'm, I'm moderating two panels at SOS uh, in 2024, Cassandra and Andrade, she's on one of my panels, industry relations, unanimously selected by everyone for the for this uh, topic. Like you were like the first name to come up. Um, nice. Yeah. So you're obviously doing something good when it comes to industry relations. I know from like personal dealings with you, I met you through Latinos in Clinical Research. And then we got a chance to work in a uh, like sales slash client potential client role where you really impressed a couple of my business partners uh, in your biz dev approach. And um, I think people need help with this kind of stuff, Cass. Like this is not something that comes natural to most people. I do believe it's something that you can develop as a skill. What do you think mm -hmm. about biz dev and, and building relationships in the industry? I mean, it's essential like anything in life, right? Any relationship you cultivate it, it takes both parties to want to invest in, in, in the outcome. Um, you know, we, we hear that oftentimes in the industry, if you're trying to sell one way and, pitch your business deal and they're on the other side, they're not receptive, then you're probably wasting your time. Right. Um, but no, I think it comes down to the long-term goal. If you're thinking short-term, you know, if let's say I wanted to sell a hat to you, Dan, and I'm thinking I'm going to get Dan on this podcast to buy this hat. It's, it's, it's I'm missing the long-term opportunity, right? <laughs> because of the fact that I want to get to know Dan, why is he wearing the hat? What hat is he wearing? Why did he choose that logo, right? Like, what what is it about the attire that Dan wears during the podcast, right? Is it sponsored? Is it not? Like, what what's the flow? What's the vibe? Um, and if you approach, I think, relationships in that way, that they're just genuine, you're authentic, and you really want to get to know the person, the sell comes afterwards, right? Well, just... I agree. There, and the one of the th reasons I think people sales people are not sale we're all sales people whether you know it or not but just people trying to make relationships you know there's gonna be at the SOS conference a bunch of people trying to network with each other people on LinkedIn you see this every minute on LinkedIn people trying to network with one another people don't get enough opportunities I think uh they don't understand the law of of averages like I need to talk to X number of people in order to close like this many deals, right? So they don't have enough of that top number. So whenever they get an opportunity, they're desperate. And then one thing everyone is good at, I believe, like everyone has different strengths and weaknesses, but human nature is very good at sniffing out bullshit and sniffing out someone else's motives Yep. When it's not aligned with their, I really think humans have this like built into them. Yeah. Well, I mean, like anything in business development, like the minute you you hear someone on LinkedIn say, hey, I'm, you know, sales or BD, they're kind of like already at arm's length. Like, really? What, what are you going to try to sell me now? <laughs> right. Um, but I think just being, being yourself and having your own approach to, to the biz dev, but, but again, it's, it's not going in for the immediate sale, but really building the relationship and understanding what what the problem where the problem lies right if if i'm trying to sell a product to a person and i'm immediately going to go to a demo and say look at my product look at these features look at this you're missing out i need to know that dan has a site in Yuma, arizona and these are the challenges that dan has and approach it that way where you really want to understand what are the problems that you're trying to solve right what are the challenges that you had i think i heard someone on the on uh, one of your pods earlier today or, or earlier this week where he was talking about like the synergies that you guys had about, you know, not following your dad's footsteps, right? And that automatically created a connection that you didn't even know you had. And now you're going to want to reach out to him later on and be like, hey, I was talking to my dad the other day and he thought about these things, right? And you're already building 
that relationship with build, which builds that trust and then that that commonality of like hey we're we're in this together kind of a thing um and that now yeah. you know that that person can be that support for you that you didn't even know you had but had you not known that he had those similar challenges that you had you would have never you've seen him as the ceo of that company and not the individual that had the same struggles that you had which was building on that foundation of you know there's more common there's more common um what is it like that attraction there's there we're, we're all similar but very different in many ways but we all want the same thing which is to help one another to grow our businesses to generate revenue but don't think about it in the short term think about it in the long term yeah there's people that like you i never met you i never met nick that's who you're referring to yeah. but i could already tell we have multiple things in common so like i already know when i meet you like we would click right away same with nick the problem is for a lot of people that's not the case like you you have to struggle to find something in common and it's easier if you're trying to sell something at the end of the day you're a biz dev right you're hired for a task like you're hired to produce like all this stuff is nice idealistic let's get to know you but like someone's paying you or your business is paying you to produce so it's counterintuitive the advice that you're giving is what works but it's counterintuitive because it feels like you're not being productive and it feels like you're being too patient so as and especially when you throw in anxiety and fear over oh i'm not gonna hit my numbers now you create desperation and now the other person can smell that and now you seem even a worse disingenuous. So it's like, this is like dangerous stuff. You got to navigate this carefully. I really don't think people do this well. Mm. The majority of people in our industry do not do this well. Yeah. I mean, you also have to, you have to take risks. And, and, and that's, I think, the biggest challenge in being in sales, right? You have to put yourself out there. And, you know, you may mentally just say, say, oh, I'm not capable or, you know, what, what can I say to this CEO of this company? You know, I'm a new BD person, if that's the case, or I'm a seasoned person, you know, I don't want to look like a fool. Well, sometimes you just got to put yourself out there because you never know what's on the other side. And I think that if you stay in your own head and let that, you know, little devil on your shoulder tell you everything that you, you probably want to hear, but don't really want to hear, you just got to try. You got to just put yourself out there. And I think that was something that I did with Latinos in clinical research, coming in new to the industry, not knowing anything about the industry, knowing very little. Are you and just saying, new? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the little experience that I had was, was doing some uh, language services for a site, a university um, in South Florida that's you know prominent in clinical research, and just getting to know them and asking the, the CRC, like, Hey, what, what do you do day in and day out? And I literally went there one day, just sat with him and saw while he was doing an uh, on-site, he had an on-site monitor from a CRO. I didn't even know what a CRO was. I mean, like talk about basics, like CRC, CRA, you know, all these acronyms were all foreign. And I was like, I'm not going to try to be a seasoned salesperson and try to sell them something that I don't know anything about. I'm going to get to know the industry by sitting with these individuals that have given me the time to have a conversation. And by sitting with them, I learned their business. And then they were like, Hey, Cass, throwing me bits of information, right? The same thing with LICR with you, Monica, Ashley and Judy and Chris and everyone. It was like, Hey guys, I'm Cass. Um, Want to get to know you guys more. And you guys started teaching me too about site ownership and all these things. So it's also surrounding yourself with people like they say that know more that are a little bit more seasoned, they become your mentors and then you can start be helping those that, you know, are, are coming into the industry. So could I have sat back and said, I'm not going to reach out to Ashley and say, Hey, I'm Cass, I'm newer. I'd like to join you. Yeah. But where would I be today? Probably not here with you, Dan, wow. probably not part of the panel. And I probably would have missed out on a huge opportunity to get to know fantastic and uh, fantastic people in the industry. So you reached out. I never really thought of how we met. <laughs> so you reached out to Ashley. Yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah. Do you think that 
so you have to take time to understand the industry, but at the same time, you had a job to do as far as selling services, right? Or keeping yeah. clients happy. So how did you balance those two things? A lot of people would say, oh, fake it till you make it. And is there an element of that? Or were you just as honest as you could be? Like, hey, I don't really understand, but let me listen to what you need and get back to you. Like, what was the approach? Yeah, I think for me, it was just understanding what problem you were trying to solve, right? More so than sell the technology because we sell technology and language services. It was like, how are the clients using this? What is their end goal? Their end goal is to ensure they have compliant you know, trials so that they can submit to the regulatory bodies to get approval for these drugs. So if the documentation isn't clear and isn't in the 21 CFR Part 11 compliant system, they're not going to have a trial to present to the FDA. So it's it's understanding, okay, why are they using it? How are they using it? And what is out there in the industry that they have approached us and not our competitors? And just being a sponge, really. So initially, I was um, t- paired up with you know a, a business development person that has been seasoned, been here for many years, just learned and grew and and listened. And then now I'm, you know, supporting a lot of our clients. So it was a mix of having existing clients to support, but also looking to to generate more revenue. So at that time, I had language services clients that I knew were running trials. And so I approached them and said, hey, look, I was helping you with this translation. Um, I'm now with a new division and we're selling technology. You know, I would love to talk to you about that because I think it's something you need. And they were like, oh, my God, yes, that's great. We're running paper trials. We want to digitize. We want to do e- ETMF. You know, how do we get started? How do we support? So mm-hmm. it was really that is is understanding more so than just selling the technology. What is what am I what am I trying? What's how am I helping these people? Right. Yeah. I don't want to sell them something they can't use. I don't want to sell them something that tomorrow they're going to say this doesn't work. Um. So I know I sound a little bit repetitive, but it's it's understanding the problem you're trying to solve. Because if you're out there just trying to pitch technology for the sake of pitching technology, you're really missing the buck. Yeah. And you hear it all the time from you and from others. Like, we want technology that can speak to one another. We don't want 12 logins. We don't want 15 passwords. You know, we want things to make our lives easier and make our our CRCs and our staff members' jobs a lot easier. And if you understand that that's, you know, the the problem that you have is a solution that we have. It kind of mirrors naturally together. Do you believe in this law of averages? Because let let me break it down real quick. So when when we were looking for our CRO, we were looking for a vendor. I mean, I can say what what vendor we want, but I don't know if you want me to. But we were looking for a vendor, and there was you, and there was like there were two other ones that came recommended to us. And one of the other ones, like you were, I knew you, but my business partners really didn't. And we all want to work with you again in the future. Can't say the same for the other ones. And and it had nothing really to do with price. You guys were all similar. Um, Technology is basically ubiquitous. It's So it has to do with you. And the, I think, in my opinion, it's you were not annoying about pressuring us, right? Mm -hmm. And can't say the same for the other one. Maybe not both, but one of them for sure was like following up like unnecessarily too many times. And you were more like, I feel like you understood more where we were coming from because we told you like, hey, we don't know if we're going to win this or not, but if we do, we're going to go with you. And the other one, like we told them the same thing, but it's like they it didn't register. They thought we were playing a game or something, mm. so it became a, like annoying, which mm. is negative equity on their end. And they have just as good a product as you. Like, <laughs> I mean, there's differences here and there. There's preferences, but at the end of the day, it's a tool we need from somebody, right? Yeah. So what it really boils down to many times is the relationships you've built and the vibe you give off on people and do like what gave you that what gave you that um 
I guess the swag of like not not feeling like you had to pressure us because you that came off really like really strong. Is it just that you know there's like enough leads to where eventually you're gonna convert and you don't need to convert everyone, or like what is it like? How come you acted that way? Yeah, um, I think for I I and and if I share too much, let me know. But I heard what you guys said. Right, which was, hey, Cass, look, we're interested. This is what we need. This is this is what we're looking for. First, can you fill that need? And I listened and I said yes. I also had to go back to senior management, right, to get their buy-in, make sure that we were going to be able to. For me, it was an investment, right, because it was also the long-term approach there, where you didn't. I wasn't saying, okay, I'm going to sell Dan this this immediately because you know they need it right now and we're going to do it right now like you were like look we don't know if we're going to get it but you know this is a long term investment it's a, it's a it's a it's a trial that i think we all need to be invested in for you know the pediatric aspect of it and children and and the investment from the ceo of the company right and you guys said look we need to have conversations internally and we'll get back to you and I respected that, but at the same time, I also had my management asking me, where are we? Um, and I said, look, they have to go to the CEO, but I fully understood where you guys were. And I think that that was one of the key differentiators for me to say, okay, what level of pressure do I put on them or level of support? Not so much pressure, but what level of support do they need for me right now? Mm -hmm. And knowing that you guys were still needing to have some serious conversations internally, it was like, understand where they are, make sure they haven't changed their mind, but give them the space to be able to make business decisions that are right for them. And I'm not looking for the short-term sale, Dan. Like for me, I want the relationship with you guys because I know in the future, there will be other opportunities. So maybe today it's $10, but in the future it could be a hundred, right? Yeah. Um, and so knowing that fine line of, and and it's, I hate to say it, but I'm very traditional in the sense of I trust your word. And so when you said, we will get back to you, and this is something we want to work on with you, provided we have the funding, I said, okay, well, you know, I, I, I know these, these gentlemen and I, you know, trust that they will stay to the word and they will give me the feedback. And I think the other thing was we established from a get-go that we wanted to be very candid with each other. If, if, if for whatever reason you guys decided that you didn't want to go with us, I wanted to understand the why. Um, and it's okay if if you need to make the best business decision for your company at that time and and you know the solution that I provide isn't the one, that's fine because later on you're gonna be like, hey, I have this person that's gonna need your technology. You know, go to CAS because I know she has it. Or but if I would have pushed you too hard, it would have been the short term gain, mm -hmm. but I would have but I would have lost the long term. And so it's kind of full circle now where it was like, great, you guys made a decision or whatever it may be at that same, the funding, you know, now to hear the feedback of like, Hey, of the three, we really liked your approach. I was like, wow, that's, that's rewarding. And that's gratifying to say, okay, great. We didn't win the short term, but in the long term, there's still something there. Um, I know my, my BD colleagues are probably like, Cass, what the hell are you talking about? Um, you know, we got numbers and goals and we got, you know, CROs, chief revenue officers on our tush about, you know, performance and metrics. But that was something that I've learned when I first started in BD, which I didn't think I was going to be in. I was like, how can I sell something? You know, who am I going to sell it to? And I think I've grown to learn that my solution, my product may not be the best fit for everyone. And I shouldn't try to force something to someone, mm -hmm. but rather understand where the problem is, build that relationship and understand that, Maybe Dan isn't the one that needs the the solution, but Dan knows someone that he can refer me to. So at the end of the day, there's a relationship there that will come to something. Now, if I don't cultivate the relationship and if I don't keep in touch with you guys and you know continue to follow up and check in and see how business is going and and monitor how you guys are doing in terms of you know the trials and things, then that's on me as the BD person. Mm -hmm. um, but at least you know, thinking of the long-term approach. People may think, you know, that's like you said, maybe a little bit passive, but um, I think for me, that's, that's really what it's about. I is not trying to sell everything to everyone. I think that's what works because it's, it, it's delayed gratification. You use the word grat, uh, gratifying. 
delayed gratification, which whether in business or in personal life, is something very difficult for people to activate. Like they, everyone wants the immediate win at all costs. And in BD, it definitely feels that way at times. And you can, you get that vibe right away from someone, whether it's like this person's willing to invest in me in the future or not. And by the way, biz dev people, they, they take their Rolodex with them when they move to another company. Yep. Like, I don't care where you go. I'm going to want to go to you when I know someone that needs something that you're affiliated with at the time. So uh, you now let's switch to like where, because you, I know you like from, from Latinos in clinical research. Hey. Obviously that didn't happen out of nowhere. Although I just assumed that somehow you were involved, but you reached out to Ashley. You were very involved in clubhouse in the early days of clubhouse. You were very involved on uh, webinars and things like that. Like what, where, and then you go in person, right? Do you go like to a lot of conferences in person, like travel? Some, some. I think we're we're starting to kick back up now. Um, uh, now after COVID, but a lot was was virtual before. But yeah, um, some of the conferences local to my area, and then also I think twenty twenty four we're looking at doing more on site, uh, visiting clients and and doing more conference conferences right. and such. And we're kicking off the year with SOS. So SOS. That's right. You're gonna be yeah. there. Twenty twenty four. So like, let's go back to like the social media and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like you, you're on, you were on all these things. You're pretty active. What do these same principles that we've talked about apply there or is it different in any way? Uh, for me personally, like, so for example, we hope, um, there was an idea that it was like, hey, we should get, well, I heard a lot of folks, it's also listening, right? So a lot of folks were saying at, a couple of years ago, we want the perspective of a CRO and an IRB when it comes to diversity in clinical trials. And so I pitched it to someone in our marketing team and I was like, look, can we do a, a webinar to have you know C a CRO and an IRB perspective when it comes to diversity in clinical trials? And I was still newer in the industry and I said, okay, I need to find the speakers. What are we gonna do? So I went on LinkedIn, I did some research and I just genuinely reached out to, to, to someone at a big CRO um, and just said, hey, my name is, you know, so-and-so. Um, we're looking to, we've heard the industry, folks want to hear from the CRO perspective. You seem like an advocate for diversity in clinical trials. We would love to give you the opportunity to share your thoughts. Would you be interested in doing a webinar? And immediately that individual said, yes, count, count on me, I'm in. And then um, through another relationship, through a colleague of mine, um, supports an IRB, and the IRB was very much, you know, using an, an industry relationship to say, hey, we're looking to do this panel. You know this person. Can you connect us? And then she was able to bring that person to the panel. And that's how we created organically the CRO and IRB uh, webinar for diversity in clinical trials, and which a lot of people are still downloading the content today. And that was like a year oh. and a half, two years ago. Um, so... It goes back to, you know, I've reached out to many people just saying, hey, you know, I'm Cass, you know, if there's anything I can do to help. Actually, recently, somebody had posted on LinkedIn, hey, we're looking for a medical writer. If anybody knows of medical writing, you know, please let me know. And I was like, yeah, we can help you out. So send them a note and said, hey, would love an introduction. Happy to help if there's you know anything you need. And worst thing we can do is have a conversation. And unfortunately, you know, that didn't pan out. Um, they decided to, to, to use in-house resources, but they said, you know, next time we're definitely going to use you guys because we were impressed with the capabilities that you all have. So with LinkedIn, I'm very much, um, authentic and genuine. I mean, we, we get it all the time. I get LinkedIn in mails mm -hmm. that are like, you know, do you want to, you know, reduce financial stress and, you know, come to this webinar and it just kind of turns you off a little bit. And you're <laughs> like, you why do you think reading. this resonates for me? Right? Like. What's in it for me, right? Or or what research have you done to then approach me and tell me why you think I should cultivate a relationship with you, right? Versus mm -hmm. just sending out mass emails, do your homework. You know, yeah. if, if you're looking to reach out to Dan and Yuma, you know, what type of studies is Dan running? Well, you know, what is what is it that they're looking to achieve in the new year? What are their goals? And approach it that way and you'll be a lot more receptive to be like, Dan, this person took the time 
to learn about us before they reached out. And they're just not reaching out blindly because I'm a site <laughs> in Yuma, right? Because each you site know can have crazy? different needs. These messages, uh, these are these people also believe in the law of averages. They understand that they need more top number to convert more bottom number. But they're going about it. Well, they would say it's efficient because all they're doing is copying and pasting. But in the long run, it's inefficient as hell because they could get blocked. They could get ignored and gone forever. If you're blocked on LinkedIn, you don't exist. Like, that's very permanent yeah and yeah. that was for a short-term opportunity like a half-assed approach my favorite ones like the clinical trials guru llc it's a one-person llc it has nothing to do really with any operations it's just my holding company for my media stuff that like these people think i'm a sponsor that are like hiring cra's through that they say specifically the clinical trials guru llc we have staffing CRAs for you, pharmacovigilance, and you can tell like they understand I'm in the industry, but they don't know why did you specifically pick that company? It makes more sense if you pick the CRO and they could have just looked at my profile and seen, but they're just picking the first company they see and then boom, copy and paste. And he, it's like a few seconds you can sniff this out and then that's it. Like even if that person's really good, that's the sad part. Like what if they're yeah. really good? Like their product's really good, but it's just that is so counterproductive. Uh, and then the strategies that you're saying work and that I know work, they don't make sense because they actually take a lot of time. Yeah. There's no yeah. payment from it yeah. right away. Yeah. It's tough to convince people to do it this way. Yeah. I mean, it's also about timing, right? And I mean, it's it's also a little bit of luck. Right. If 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 you're looking for that product at that time when I reach out, right? It's it's like, oh, perfect timing. I'm looking for this, right? But often But that's what those mass spammers are hoping for too. It's like it's exactly. the right time for everybody. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, there are deals that have taken a year, three yeah. years. <laughs> I mean, some of the co but it's it's the it's it's you've gotta be in it for the long term. And and hopefully like I don't know. I hope, I hope that that, you know, does convert. They, they say hope is not a strategy, but at the same time, like, yes, we have to send out our emails and, and do our, you know, go back to calling too. A lot of people have forgotten about, you know, picking up the phone and yeah. instead of just sending some emails. Um, Cause that goes a long way, but yeah, in terms of LinkedIn strategy, it's, for me, it's the same approach of just being personable, understanding the person who they are. And uh, it's been rewarding for me in sense of, um, having some people join webinars and also having some opportunities to have conversations about new business opportunities as well. So, mm. um, yeah, that's, that's what works. One of the things we're going to have at SOS is, a. I don't even know if I'm allowed to mention this yet, but it's going to be a needs and offerings board. So like with real sticky notes where people put like, this is what I need. This is what I'm offering. And that's like real like value add right there, right? Because if you don't need what this person's offering, you're like, yeah, not right now. It's nice to know, but I don't need it. But like you see something you need, you're like, okay. And what are they actually offering? Okay, well, here's what I'm offering. You can actually provide value. Um, it's kind of a way to facilitate providing value up front. And yeah. ultimately, I think in its essence, like that's what BizDev does is yeah. provide value like you educated us on what your tech does which is a big part of our industry which all three of us didn't really have that much of a expertise in so you provided value you basically wasted your time to provide us the value but like you said in the long run you planted seeds for potential future either referrals which people underestimate a lot yes or just direct business yeah. from us later. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's that's one of the key things too is um, not being afraid to ask for the referral, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. Because that also can convert. Like, great, Dan knows, but, you know, I also take this opportunity to say, hey, Dan, if there's anyone you know that's looking for this, you know, would love the referral. And if you think highly of that individual, the BD person, you're like, of course you know what let me think about it let me introduce you to so-and-so but if i don't ask you for the referral you're going to sit with this good feeling of this bd person 
but you know don't forget to ask it's the call to action so, here's a quotable if you don't use it i might in the panel what we're really going for as biz dev or salespeople or just people trying to make industry relations you want to live rent free in that person's head there like, you go for as long as you can and if you like if you don't do something to maintain that they'll you'll leave like there's only so much space in that person's brain to have you in there rent free yeah yeah so now i know for the tool you offer like you're already living there and you've been maintaining it so you're there like uh, it's automatic someone asked me oh yeah that's cast cast um but not everyone gets that space in mm, the head that's true that's true that's a cool yeah. oh i might use that i love that <laughs> How do you, how, so that could be the intro. How do you live rent free in somebody's mind? <laughs> yeah, but in a good way, because like the person has to voluntarily want to keep you there. Yeah, totally. Because like there's bad people that were living rent free for a while, but they're it's like a week and then I kick them out like ASAP. You know, like you get mad and you kick them out. But there's good ones that live there. You're like, yeah, this person's it's good to have them in here. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. That. That's amazing. Uh, so LinkedIn, what like you're, what about like posting and commenting? So I have to, I have to admit again, uh, nobody's perfect, right? I haven't really posted a lot. I haven't found, I think, for me the the approach that I want to take with posting. So I do occasionally. I've I've actually interestingly enough, I'll do I will post like um, webinars that I think would be helpful for folks. And, but when I post personal messages, it seems like those are the ones that get the most like yeah. response rate. And like, I'm like, well, this is interesting, right? So I really want to help by providing some industry knowledge on that side. But I think people really want to hear personal opinions tied to that for a value add. Um, I do comment a lot. Um, I really, what I really like though to do is connect people. So if I see someone that's looking for a job and I know someone, so I'll just be like, hey, so-and-so or LICR, let's say like, you know, a sponsor company is saying that they have like a Latino board and they're looking for members or whatever. I'll like just tag LICR like, hey guys, you know, watch out. Actually, there's um, I tagged you on something last night. There's uh, this this gentleman that I do respect highly um, in terms of a uh, sales training, and uh, he's looking for someone to do a podcast with. And I tagged. Oh really? You, like, Thank you. I gotta go. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta he's just like that. he wants to to just chat about life, about sales, about this, and I was like, Dan, 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 Dan. Oh, so. cool. See, I was living rent free in your head right there. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Uh, and, oh, I see this. I see it right now. Yeah. yeah, I've learned a lot from um from them. I did mm. a, a a a training session with them, and um, I think it just it challenges you to not think about the short term and and to really how to elevate your game in, in business development so yeah um, you know I this is like get... i hope people who are in biz dev and sales understand this but what about because i we opened the show with and i don't know if you agree with me or not but everyone you're we're all in sales whether you know it or not like job candidate yeah. you know we're gonna have a lot of coordinators there they're in sales a lot of them don't know it. Well, like, how else do you get patients in your study? So <laughs> someone has to, that's a big sales role, actually. That's like never discussed. Like coordinators are sales? No. Yeah, they are. Or like career seekers, you know, you're, you're promoting yourself. Um, CRAs are salespeople. They have to convince multiple stakeholders for certain outcomes. What, what about for like, can you speak a little bit to the people who may not consider themselves sales? Like, they might be listening and say, oh, that's good for you, Cass. You got to actually sell stuff. Mm. Uh, for me, I just got a job to do or market my own career. Like yeah. I need immediate outcome. I can't be planting seeds long term. Well, I think it depends on what their personal interests are and what they where they want to head, right? What their career path is. Um, we all are our own personal brand. Like you said, if if living i mean I think, I think that was the key to this right how do you live rent free in somebody else's mind you want to be able to have someone it's the this first impression it's the brand and the legacy that you want to leave behind as well right so what is it that you want to project to people is it someone that 
is just looking for the immediate gratification and 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 grabbing from people or are you looking to give back as well right so i 100 percent think we are all our own public affairs or uh, public relations advocates right we have to do our own pr whether it's trying to sell something or whether it's building our own brand so that we can then go to the job that we want even if we may not have all the qualifications um, what about so, for those entitled, the entitled mentality of, Cass, Dan, this is great for other people, but my skills are so good at what I do that, and my education is so good that someone should want to see that in me. I don't, I shouldn't have to promote myself. There's actually like a surprisingly large number of people in this category, especially the advanced degree holders. My degree, my PhD is enough, Cass, like. I don't have to be going out there. Maybe you do if you have a bachelor's, but I have a PhD. I don't need to, I shouldn't have to go out there and do all that. Um, I think that's the ego speaking. <laughs> they need to humble themselves first, right? Because <laughs> your degree will only get you so far, but it won't keep you in the door, right? If you can't build relationships and you can't understand perspective from other people and really really kind of humble yourself to put yourself in situations that you may feel that you're not apt for and you're missing out. And so, yeah, while, while the PhD or, or those folks that may, you know, come in with some credibility on their shoulders and saying, this is speaks for itself. I think personally, that only can get you so far and it can open the door, but what else are you going to do to build relations with your colleagues too? Cause it's not just your clients, it's your colleagues, you know, what about, you know, the, 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 the team mentality of like, Hey, we are in this to help our patients. We're here for, you know, the patient themselves. And there's going to be days where we're going to have to stay late. And there's going to be days that we're going to have to work on these, these items that we don't want to do. And it's not really the hat that I got the job that they selected me for, but I'm going to have to go and, you know, help fill out a, a, a consent form with a client because I speak the language or whatever it may be. So if you have that like chip on the shoulder that your 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 degree is only you know good enough and it speaks for itself, then I think you know people can read that as well and they'll be like, oh, that this person feels that they're entitled and they're better, so they can do it on their own. And you know maybe if you just you know look at the big picture and say, look, we're all a team, and and there are things that I can learn from others, and I'm not perfect because nobody is. Um, I don't know. I think for me, it's it's again. Maybe BD is not the best role for me, right? But the team mentality and, and thinking about the big picture in the long term and really just looking at, you know, how can you help and serve others is is really the goal. Um, because, yes, it's a numbers game. And, yes, we have, you know, target over our head. But at the same time, um, just the short-term thinking and, you know, that I'm better at this than you are is just, I think, very short-sighted. Yeah. There's a, that's a whole podcast, just that topic right there. I mean, maybe we can do that like a part two later, but I want to thank you for coming on um, and looking forward to seeing you at uh, SOS. I think we got some stuff out of this that we could use there. Um, one of the things I wanted to bring up and maybe we'll save it for there, but it's, um, well, I guess the concept of being short-sighted or giving value giving value before you receive and how to make that genuine because at some level i don't want to get too metaphysical but that's like a, a spiritual thing too and i think this <laughs> this is where sales delves into the spirit realm because what we've essentially said this whole time is be a good person and like a lot of people got to do some internal reflecting on that one. Like it, the, if you're not a good person, that's just going to come off as a tactic, right? And this is where this gets into another level. And maybe it's for other podcasts, but it's something I want everyone to think about. And maybe we can explore a little bit more at SOS. I don't know what yeah. you think about and, this. And I think, I think the beauty is that my approach doesn't have to be like anyone else's and other people's approach doesn't have to be like mine. So what works for me may not work for all, but if there's anything that they can take away from this is to be authentic and genuine. 
-hmm. because like you said, it comes across when you're not, when you're just trying to sell something to someone without yeah. really taking the time to invest in them. And I think for, for there are BT folks that I know that it's a totally different approach, right? And it's a lot more aggressive and it's a lot more in your face and it's a lot more maybe how you felt with the other individual. Um, and that may resonate with some people, but I think it's it's knowing your audience and really taking the time to understand what you're selling um, because if not, you, the same approach doesn't work for every individual as well. So my style is could be one way, but if I know that this person is looking for something else, then you you learn how to pivot and provide them that value or provide them that way that they they want the outreach, right? Some people want to cut to the chase, right? They don't really want to build a relationship. They just need what you have and and you cut to that if that's what they want. But you really need to understand where the other person's coming from to be able to tailor your approach to them. And to get the so. opportunity to pitch to that person because that person who may want right away, he's still he or she's still vetting you out. Like, did you prepare? Do you actually know what we're doing or is it like a template you're using? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Do you know what? what, what yeah. Yeah. There's a lot there that we got to get into on the panel, but hopefully this was helpful to someone watching and listening. And hopefully it was helpful to you, Cass, to prepare for the panel. I think we got a few quotes. Yeah, to you, Dan, <laughs> too. I hope you took some nuggets from this. I mean, if anything, we got if I few. could still live rent free and Dan spare his uh, mind that I'm doing something good. <laughs> That's the goal. I think for anyone in this, that needs stuff later or trying to produce an outcome is you want people to think about you for things. Yeah. So, and that's the hardest you, thing. I appreciate yeah. it. Cassandra's LinkedIn is underneath this video or in the show notes. If you're listening, go connect with her. Like it's obvious. She's somebody you need to connect with. So go do it. Come say hi to her at SOS. We're on the last panel of the day. So oh, there you go. It's industry relations. And then it's the official after party afterwards. Oh, geez. We lean, we lean into that. That's one way to build yeah. relationships at the after party. It is. And we're going to say, like, now go implement some of these things in the next hour over some drinks. Or if you don't drink, just go implement it sober. Have Even some good better. conversations. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, nah, it's not better sober. <laughs> well, Cass, thank you so much for coming on. Cass's LinkedIn is underneath. Like, subscribe, comment, share. Go connect with her right now. Bye-bye.